I first want to thank the Heartland Institute and Joe Bass particularly for inviting me and uh, allowing me to give this talk. I want to begin by contrasting the Great Contraction and Great Depression of 1929-33 with 1933-41 and with the current Great Recession as it's called. And uh, in doing so, I want to present some of Milton Friedman's thoughts. And finally, uh, I want to try to emphasize some things he would have emphasized about the Great Recession, which he did not live to uh, see. Uh, I don't speak for him, of course. Nobody could. Uh, but. Um, I think I can emphasize some of the things he might have wanted to emphasize. Now, Milton Friedman was a, a great teacher, but he was, I think of him more positively as a, a scientist. And he, uh, he demonstrated that by a book he wrote called The Methodology of Positive Economics, which had a, a very good reception although there were certain elements in the economics profession that didn't like it. Murray Rothbard, by the way, was one of them. But um, uh, he, he was a scientist, and he was especially interested in what uh, he said was existing static monetary theory, which has had a form of the quantity theory of money as its basic core in all of its major variants to explain the structural or secular level of prices. Then he and his co-author, Anna Schwartz, who I was just saying at the table that she should have long ago had the Nobel Prize in economics and still hasn't got it, uh, wrote uh, several uh, uh, important books in, uh, in the field, particularly um, Monetary History of the United States, and which is a magnificent treatise and something anyone can read, although you may have to skip certain sections. Um, uh, uh, Friedman was born in 1912, the year before Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act. So he and the, and the Federal Reserve grew up together, but I don't say that was a warm and loving relationship. <laughs> and, uh, but it, uh, nevertheless, uh, he began to turn more and more of his attention to monetary economics and um, in both the, both the theory and the empirical research about it. Um, he and uh, Anna Schwartz uh, treated the uh, Great Contraction, and particularly uh, they were especially critical of the Federal Reserve's so-called so ineptness during the Great, uh, bringing on the Great Contraction of 1929 33. Uh, um, when uh, the Fed allowed the economy to, uh, the monetary system particularly, to uh, contract at the rate of 8% uh, per year uh, and uh, the economy to suffer a catastrophic uh, uh, contraction. This disastrous policy was close to qualifying as criminal negligence on the part of the Federal Reserve Board. Material I have recently collected and published confirms that five of the nine members of the board initiated the Great Contraction. That is, the Fed didn't just stand by idly and do nothing, but rather the, they instituted a policy called direct pressure on the banking system. And the direct pressure was uh, 
a, a, a policy in pursuit of terrorists. Oops, I mean speculators. Uh, a, the word greedy, the words greedy speculator will always get a sympathetic nod from almost anyone. Uh, to implement direct pressure, the Fed board ordered the Fed banks not to give any credit assistance to any needy member bank if it had had any stock market connections or other dealings that could be labeled speculative. And one uh, member, particularly Adolph C. Miller, who'd been on the board ever since 1914 and had been reappointed, first appointed by Wilson, then later by Coolidge, reappointed, uh, was, uh, wrote an article which was published in the American Economic Review in 1935 in which he <coughs> exalted over the direct pressure policy. And the practical effect of the policy was a, was a virtual moratorium on Fed bank lending, which went almost to zero between 1929 and 1933. Discount rate policy, which the Fed banks uh, operated under, that would ordinarily have rationed Fed bank credit became ineffectual because the direct pressure policy dominated credit accommodation. If a bank could not get a loan at any discount rate because it was guilty of speculation, the interest rate which could not borrow from a Fed bank did not matter. Fed policy was not only inept, it was ignorantly destructive. So we want to watch out if we're going to count on the Fed to, to pull us out of the current problem. After their initial, policy, po uh, initial folly of direct pressure, um, Federal Reservists went after the gold standard, their favorite scapegoat. And as Friedman noted in an article he wrote in 1961, real and pseudo gold standards, a real gold standard is thoroughly consistent with liberal principles, and I, for one, am entirely in favor of, of measures promoting its development. He noted that the Fed had never allowed any gold standard to function after World War I, and that's, uh, my own research shows that to, to be the case, too. <coughs> um, uh, the Fed, he said, at all times had ample power to provide the liquidity that the public and the banks so desperately sought and the provision of which would have cut short the vicious chain reaction of bank failures. Um, and the, uh, a small group of men on the Fed board, he noted, uh, were able to implement this policy, which had worldwide consequences. Uh, <clears throat> whereas if, the, uh, if Congress did not understand the reason for the problem and therefore could not correct the disaster that its agency had created, had Fed policymakers simply maintained the common money stock where it was in 1929, neither a great contraction nor the subsequent Great Depression could have occurred. Or if they'd simply allowed the legitimate gold standard to work, the economy would have begun to recover by 1931. Today, unfortunately, we do not have any kind of gold standard. Instead, we have an omnipotent central bank. And through the decades since 1933, successive acts of Congress have added the power to both the Fed Board and the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. So, so every time the Fed monetary policy falls on its face, the Fed gets more power. That happened in the recent past when 
Congress gave it the power to pay interest on bank reserve deposits that it holds for the banks. <coughs> so, uh, so the Fed never gets less power. Now it had all the power it ever needed when it was formed, and uh, but of course, I can't go into that right now. Uh, uh, during World War II, the Fed was again simply a lackey of the Treasury Department. Its primary function, as you may, some of you may remember, was to support the market prices of government securities to keep their interest rates low. After the war, Congress passed the Employment Act of 1946 that called, called for government policies in support of high levels of employment and output. Then a congressional resolution in 1951 uh, sort of cemented that idea and, and uh, into policy and and told the uh, uh, and had the Fed and the Treasury reach an accord so that they didn't uh, uh, play in each other's backyards, as Senator Douglas put it and that they were to be guided primarily by considerations <coughs> relating to their effects on employment, production, purchasing power, and price levels. Now all of these goals are eminently virtuous. They are more than either a Fed or a Treasury can deliver. Neither agency can promote private employment or production other than by not intervening in market processes. That leaves price levels, and here is the one and only goal that any central bank can markedly influence and perhaps affect with a lag that is variable. 